talk about a research paper that we are currently working on. It, it, it does exist in some uh, relatively finished form, uh, so it's available if, if you would like to have the paper, but it's uh, based on uh, what I believe is a fantastic data set on movement of, of um, basically high-skilled human capital uh, from various places into private uh, business firms. Uh, and, and what we are particularly interested in is the movement of scientists from research universities into uh, private business firms and how that affects innovation. Right, so let's start off with uh, open innovation. Uh, so this guy, he was also alluded to in Karl Scrum's talk yesterday, is Joseph Schumpeter, uh, and he was really the guy who coined uh, the, the term, the much used term, uh, innovation, uh, as many of you will, will know. Uh, but I guess that the only sort of closed, really closed innovation model that we have ever seen uh, is really that uh, model of 1912 in the theory of economic development where uh, Josef Schumpeter basically suggested that uh, innovations are made by individual entrepreneurs and then introduced into the economy and this will have a major effect or can have major effect subsequently. But already uh, later in his career Schumpeter himself realized uh, that there were also other types of innovation and not so typically what we refer to as Schumpeter Mark II, that is more incremental innovations introduced by large corporations uh, that have economies of scale and so on. Uh, but already here, uh, there starts to be a recognition that innovation is fundamentally a social process. Okay, so it goes on uh, inside large corporations, but it is a social process invo involving several individuals. And <clears throat> since then, we have seen uh, the innovation literature from the, let's say, the 60s, 70s onwards, uh, really uh, developing this also to include the fact that external input to innovation uh, is extremely important. And when I say innovation, I should say that I'm relatively old-fashioned in this way, so I, I, I tend to refer to technological innovation. That, that, that's what I really mean by that, and in particular, uh, product innovation. There can be other kinds of innovation, of course, that, that would then affect uh, uh, product uh, you know, innovation, but, but by and large, I, I talk about innovation as being, as being technological innovation in this particular context. It's not, it's not because I want to say that it's only that, but that's just what I talk about. So, uh, given all these studies, basically, my, my argument is that uh, even if I, probably my name is uh, associated with the term open innovation, uh, I, I'm saying that this idea that firms rely on external knowledge, that is not really new. Uh, we can take uh, Eric von Hippel's work from the mid-1970s where he documented that actually in uh, scientific instruments uh, around 80% of the innovations were made by users and not by the producer firms. Uh, so, <clears throat> so basically uh, the, the fact that, that, uh, that users can play a, and, and other uh, external actors can play a major role in the innovation process has been recognized for a pretty long period of time. But of course uh, probably Henry Chesbrough wouldn't have gotten so much attention unless he had uh, had something new to say. And, I, <laughs> and in my uh, humble view, the, the, this is really the fact that there are some drivers at this point in time that seems to be uh, accelerating this process. Uh, we have strong, I, th I think definitely in Europe, but also in the United States, we have much stronger labor mobility. Uh, people tend to, to change jobs much more often, the idea that you work for the same corporation for, for the entire career uh, is, uh, uh, is not, no longer so strongly uh, accepted or, or, or at least not carried out. Uh, we have uh, much stronger, uh, we, have, we have a much stronger division of labor uh, and, and also uh, in particular in, what, in some countries there is the increase of, of uh, venture capital that can fund new corporations. And the basic argument of, of uh, Henry Tresbrough is then that these uh, erosion factors, as he calls them, that they are really uh, hollowing out the benefits from doing private R&D, and for that reason you need to counterbalance this with other measures. That, that, is, that would be measures that include uh, using external sources of innovation. So the second point, I think, is that uh, 
what we have learned from the openness literature is that it's, it's not only about just being open to one particular source, it's really about managing a whole range of sources of innovation. And also that there are costs associated with working with external parties. So I, I will be talking about some of these costs related to uh, universities later on. Of course, there's a lot of benefits, but one has to acknowledge the costs uh, of, of this sort of interaction uh, before engaging in it. Uh, so the erosion factors uh, I, I alluded to before, they have to do with mobility, venture capital, but perhaps also to an increased, let's say, relevance or quality of, of, uh, of university research. Uh, one area is, is the emergence of biotechnology that has uh, spawned a lot of, um, of uh, spin-outs also in, in, in the region, in the Copenhagen region, uh, the Copenhagen region where I come from. We have uh, seen increased competition, uh, and I, sh I should not in this, uh, con or in the context of this conference, I should not uh, really underestimate the role of globalization that has led to a much easier dissemination of knowledge uh, across, across the globe. So uh, this is sort of the landscape that we are looking at. Uh, and these are the things that are really challenging, let's say, the stylized old model of closed innovation where firms could just rely on their internal uh, R&D. The problem is that when you have a lot of uh, mobility out of the firm, then you might not be able to uh, capture all the value that, that, that you could in the past. So you, you really need to, to, to do stuff to, to uh, counterbalance that. But in addition to this, um, we have some clear advantages of, of, uh, of open innovation uh, in general. Uh, for instance, I, I, I talked about Eric von Hibbel's work on, on users. So what users can really do is that they can uh, bring in experience uh, into product development uh, that is context specific. And in some cases, actually, when users also have skills, they might even be able to do some of the innovations in the first place, or at least to come up with the first basic ideas that are then developed by private business firms. Uh, there's also the, the role of getting to collaborate with firms that have complementary assets. Uh, so firms uh, may have some technological skills. There may be other firms that have a complementary set of technology skills, marketing skills, and so on, that can be combined uh, uh, to, to the advance of productivity. Uh, what, what open uh, innovation can also bring is a different perspective. Uh, that there's this paper that I'm alluding to on, on my slide here by Jebsen and Lacani in Organization Science, where they show that sort of the unusual uh, suspects uh, tend to solve uh, problems that are posted uh, in online communities much better, in particular women appear to be much better at solving these very difficult technological problems. Uh, so I, I would actually recommend to go and, and, and read that work. Uh, and, and another thing is the um, is, uh, access uh, to the science base that will bring in a number of skills that I'll, I'll talk a lot about uh, during the rest uh, of, my, of my time available. Uh, however, uh, again, as I said before, there are some costs uh, involved in this, and those costs uh, would include two things. Uh, basically, uh, firms only have a, a limited set of resources. And, and one point is that if you work with a source of innovation, with a user, you need to invest in this. Um, and of course, you can uh, also use the university example for this. If you, if you, as a firm, want to work with universities, it will require specific investment in that relation and an understanding of the norms and incentive systems that, that function uh, within the university system. And that's, of course, a challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge to many private organizations to, to deal with this. <clears throat> um, and the second one, uh, when we go, uh, go beyond the resources of the individual firms, of course, there are also risks re related to uh, the appropriability that's associated with this. So the more open you are, uh, the more you need to expose your ideas. Nobody is going to work with you if you're not open yourself. So it, it, there is this sort of exchange that uh, you would like to get knowledge into your organization as a private firm, but in exchange, you need to give something away, and there is a chance that this could be appropriated uh, by 
other agents that might end up being your competitors. So it, it's just to say that it's not uh, easy here. Um, there are also some characteristics uh, of, of firms that, that sort of the accumulated evidence uh, uh, from, from research has shown that uh, <coughs> firms that rely on university research uh, are typically, but not always, uh, come from science-based industries. They tend to be larger firms. They spend more on research and development. Uh, and another thing that has come out of my own work with Eamon Salter, who is over there uh, to the right scene from, from your point of view, is that, um, that firms that are more open in general uh, tend also to engage much more in university industry collaboration. Um, so this seems to, to, to me to suggest that uh, there is really a challenge here from the point of view of firms in terms of strategy. That it's not only about working with the universities, and not all the difficulties are just difficulties of working with universities. It's just difficulties that has to do with managing, being open to the, to the external community in terms of dealing with the IP, in terms of allocating resources, and so on. Um, so what, the, the thing that I really want to focus on today is um, inward mobility of uh, university researchers. So that would be uh, university researchers who have worked at a university uh, at, a, uh, at a level that's past the, the graduate level. So they would have to have worked in a university at least, uh, at least as uh, postdocs or uh, has had the, 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 the uh, assistant professor career at the beginning of an academic career in a university. Um, so, uh, one, and, and, and I think this is important in an open innovation context because it's exactly one of the most important erosion factors that, that uh, Henry Chesbrough mentions in his, uh, in his 2003 book. So, uh, here's a quote from uh, a Merck annual report that I found. So, it says that Merck accounts for about one, so of course we know that Merck is, is, a, is a huge corporation located in, in New Jersey. They account for 1% uh, of the biomedical research in the world. But to tap into the remaining 99%, we must actively reach out to universities, research institutions, and companies worldwide to bring the best of technology and potential products into Merck. Um, so one way of tapping into research, that is simply by hiring researchers into to, to the knowledge production of, of these private corporations. And that's indeed what uh, I'm, I'm doing in this paper that's using this fantastic data that we have uh, on the Danish labor market. That is data uh, that tracks every single movement of, um, of human capital from one firm to the other or from a uh, university. Uh, to, to a, a private firm and can at the same time account for the level of education of these people. Uh, so what we're looking at here basically is new graduates. Uh, it would be people from other firms and uh, incomers from universities. And our, our benchmark here that we compare everything to would be people who tend to stay uh, inside the firm. So any effect we find uh, is compared to stayers within firms. And of course we have some suspicion that uh, uh, those that come into the firm will bring something new and will help the innovation process within these firms. <clears throat> so what, what is it really that it has been, a, in this conference, there's been a lot of talk about the benefits uh, of university industry, um, university industry collaboration. Uh, and, but I think it's also important to focus on what it is that science can do for private research. Uh, I, I will talk a little bit about in, 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 well, in, in, in a couple of minutes about the differences between technological search and scientific search because they're not the same, uh, but uh, scientific search uh, can play a very important role when it comes to, uh, when it comes to sort of uh, funneling uh, uh, or, or supporting uh, technological search. So what it can do is uh, the obvious one, of course, it can it can stimulate uh, research. It can be a part of research that leads directly to products. So that's what is known as a linear model. Uh, it works pretty well for things such as pharma and biotech and so on, scientific dis discovery. It will be then developed subsequently uh, by private firms. Uh, and then 
uh, uh, put into commercial use. <coughs> that is, of course, something we have to acknowledge that that, that, is, still, that is still important, in particular in these science-based industries. But beyond that, uh, it is important because what do scientists do? Well, they, br they bring networks. So this means that when, when uh, 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 researchers and private uh, uh, firms have problems, they can rely on uh, they can rely on these networks back to um, back to their universities. I'll give you an example, a very old example, in fact, of this. Now we have many new examples. I'll give you an old one, um, and the final one is the uh, application of general uh, scientific research skills and techniques. <coughs> and here's another old piece of research that I really really like. Um, <coughs> it's by uh, by. Uh, uh, Irvine and Martin uh, from the early 70s, and they um, followed a group of uh, UK radio astronomers. So these are the guys that look for extraterrestrial life. And I think most people would say that's pretty irrelevant uh, to use a modern term. It really doesn't have any particular uh, industrial application. But they, they uh, document in a neat way what happened to these radio astronomers, astronomers as they went into private business and the sort of skills that they could apply in other kinds of work in, ter in terms of relying on theory and to use the, their knowledge about instrumentation, basically. So, so more general skills that could be applied uh, in, 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 other, uh, in other fashions, in, in another context, in this context, in this particular case, in, in, in private research. Uh, on, this is my old example, uh, which, which is still one of my favorite examples. It's from Gibbons and Johnson's 74 paper. So a respondent noted that, and this is, this is, this is an interview with a, a person working in private R&D. Whenever we had a naughty problem, I knew I could always go up to the uni and talk it over with the electronics people I knew from the old days. And <clears throat> what's more, use their equipment and library. I kept this quiet and I got the reputation uh, as a man to see with a difficult problem. So he had this secret. He had, uh, a, he had a network within a university uh, that he could rely on as his role as a, as a problem solver. Um, so what, 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 what is it more in particular that scientists can do? Well, they can uh, come up with um, uh, solutions to problems uh, and, and suggest an alternative ways of tackling it. How can they do this? Um, the uh, literature that studies uh, the role of scientists uh, suggests that it really has to do with the application of theory and scientific method. Uh, so because of having underlying theories, um, because you have underlying theories, you can rely on this as a map of the search landscape when you search for technological solutions. It's a, of course, there will be many, 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 many potential solutions. But if you have a theory that can guide you, you might be able to do a more directed search when you look for technological uh, solutions. And indeed, this is what Fleming and Sorensen suggest, that in the technological landscape, having a theory about that landscape helps you in finding a solution. Uh, it can also help you to eliminate uh, a priori uh, solutions to these, to, to these problems that will not work from the theoretical point of view. Uh, and, and, and again, it can, if, if you believe in your theory, it can also lead you to be more persistent. If you just rely on trial and error, as, as, as many people in industrial research do, uh, it's just a, it's a matter of whether it works or not, but if it's a matter of, of understanding why it works, that gives a different perspective. And you might persist even more to test this idea because you believe that it's theoretically wrong. There are, there are many stories from uh, technology history that, that really underlines this idea that that uh, people with theoretical background insisted on this idea, and they turned out to be right. There's, of course, also many that were wrong, that we don't hear about, but in, in general, it's a good idea to have, um, uh, to have a theory, and I, I believe that's what science can really contribute in this context. So, <clears throat> so in, indeed, scientists can bring another perspective. We have up here a, a beach, and that's how most people will view their vacation, a beach and a volcano here over in the back. Uh, Whereas uh, the scientist uh, would see this uh, slightly differences. Uh, for instance, the drink over here, e evaporation rate at 30 uh, degrees Celsius, question mark. Dormant uh, shield volcano, last eruption, question mark. So uh, 
uh, this really also underlines the idea that, that, uh, that uh, scientists have theories about these. It's not only about watching the landscape up there, it's about why do these things look the way they do and, and, and about understanding that. So yes, scientists could bring another perspective. So that, that leads, leads me to the first hypothesis in our paper uh, that basically says uh, human capital with high skill is a good thing for innovation. So when you hire more of these people, that being either recent graduates or people from other firms or university ones, that they will have a positive impact on your subsequent innovation output. Uh, but not only that, given these uh, specific skills that, uh, that scientists have, scientists can bring more than the two other categories. They can bring more than, than new graduates and people that have firm experience. At least is our, is, is, is our hypothesis. <clears throat> now, comes, now comes the difficult part, and, and, and I think it's, it's important to highlight this with the, within the context of this conference, that uh, uh, the, the, this, this university, I, I saw a presentation yesterday uh, here at the conference that I found very stimulating, and it, it mentioned the idea of, uh, of cultural differences between, uh, b between uh, the technology sphere, private firms, and and the university fear, but, but I think perhaps it, it's better to think about these in terms of, of uh, more fine-grained dimensions, uh, such as uh, the nature of the goals that are considered legitimate within these two spheres, and they are, they are not the same um, in, 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 when it comes to technological solution. What you rely on is really to find a solution. You don't care too much about why it works as long as it works, whereas uh, the, the legitimate kind of knowledge within science, that is, we have to have an understanding why this goes on. Um, also, the norms of behavior between the two spheres is, is, is always going to be a challenge. Uh, I, I myself, a uh, social scientist, and in, in, in some aspects I behave like other scientists, I want to publish my work. It's important to me to get my name on publications. And, uh, the scientists I talked to in Copenhagen, that is a hard scientist, they obviously have the same I have the same desire, so I want to put the knowledge out there. Uh, and that is, of course, not necessarily in line with what the firm wants to do that is interested in protecting and getting patents and, and commercializing this. I'm not saying it's impossible to solve this. I think this conference shows it's, it, it, it can be solved, but it requires uh, subtle uh, management. And then the, the, the final point that really makes a big difference, that, is, that would be the reward systems. Uh, so scientists are typically concerned about their reputation, their citations, their standing inside the scientific networks, whereas uh, in, in firms that's for profit, so, so that's not a prime concern. There are many, let's say, clever organizations these days that give scientists some rights in this direction as, as a way of trying to solve it. But, but, uh, but, but, but it, 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 as, as a starting point, these two systems are, are different in these ways. Academic scientists, they, have a, they tend to have a, what, what, what researchers have called a taste for science. So they uh, uh, basically, uh, as Scott Stern would have it, pay to be scientists. So he posed this uh, interesting question. Do scientists pay to be scientists in, in terms of giving up future income and so on? So he looked at, at people that became scientists and... and, and, and uh, people that did not become scientists but with sim similar traits. And, and, and it is true when you match them early on that scientists get considerably less income. Uh, uh, but they get other stuff uh, that's, that's important to them. They uh, have uh, preferences for basic research and not least, um, and, and this is perhaps more general, they have a strong preference for autonomy. That is in terms of making decisions about uh, what they're working on. Uh, and, and as I said, they are really willing to, to pay for this. Um, second one is that, that, that there's research that shows that industry, to a large extent these days, rely on science. But that is not the same as to say that they rely on the very best science in the world. So there's a very interesting study uh, by Gittleman and Kogut, where they, sh they, they look at uh, patents and, and, and publications and it turns out that uh, scientists with a very, very strong academic rec record in terms of publication output, 
their patents in general don't seem to be as cited as other more, let's say, medium scientists. Um, so it's really not for the, in the technological sphere. It's important to have a content of, uh, it has to be a science content, but it not, need not be at the very uh, frontier that the very best scientists. They have to be good, but maybe not the very best. So all of these, um, these uh, uh, observations suggest that uh, these two worlds that we have over here, scientists and, and uh, some business people down here, that <clears throat> they might, might not be oil and water, but there are definitely things that we need to concern, that we need to, to be concerned about when we put them together in university industry collaboration. So I, 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 I consider myself somehow a scientist, so I don't know if I really want to buy this uh, cartoon here, but uh, uh, these scientists uh, are saying once they hear, I've, I think I found the Higgs boson here in the sofa. So, uh, <coughs> but it, it might not be as bad as that, I hope. Um, so basically what we are saying here is that boundary crossing is associated with costs. So moving from a university into the private sphere is going to be costly. There's going to be a learning cost there in, in actually getting these people to work productively within private firms. Our argument is also that as firms get experienced with working with these strange creatures that are called scientists, people that like to publish, uh, people that might ac accept lower uh, paychecks for autonomy, people that have a preference for publishing their work rather than protecting it, that, um, that, that that firm can actually get accustomed to that, but they need to set in place practices that can accommodate for it. So uh, firms need to, in other words, to build up sort of capacity. And so our simple hypothesis is that firms with experience in hiring uh, university scientists, they will get more out of it compared to those that have no prior experience in hiring with respect to innovative activity. Uh, the final uh, hypothesis that we are examining is, is a further test of the network idea that I talked about before because I, think, I really think that this idea of the network that when scientists uh, go out in private companies and work there, one of their strongest uh, assets would be the network that they have back at the university, that they can really draw on that network. If the old professor that they had at the university does not know the solution to this particular problem, uh, it might be that he or she has a colleague uh, that, that, can, that can help you and then you can get directed to, to, to find a better solution. Uh, one problem that graduates have when they come straight from university is that they might not be strongly embedded uh, inside the university. So they don't have this network. They might have the potential for it because obviously uh, they are clever people. They have uh, completed a, a high level degree. <clears throat> but they might not have access to that network. So our argument is that if a firm has scientists employed in, uh, there already that might have these network, when young people come in from university, they can tap in to the uh, scientists in the firm's network, uh, to the, those scientists who are already working in those firms. Uh, so in this, in this way, uh, graduates that come into private firms where they already have scientists should be more productive regarding innovation uh, uh, than, than if they do not have, uh, if the focal firm does not have this sort of, of, um, of uh, hiring. Uh, so here's our context. Uh, this, is, um, this is the medical faculty at uh, Copenhagen University. It's not the only uh, thing that's in our sample, but it's just one example. Uh, uh, and over here is uh, the headquarter of Novo Nordisk up in the north of, uh, of uh, Copenhagen. And sort of our prime uh, interest here is really to see when people move, make this movement in periods T and uh, uh, T minus 1 and, and, and T minus 2, what the effects then are on, on innovation outcomes. What we do is to take this uh, pretty amazing data set. Uh, I can say that because I, I didn't... Uh, collect the most impressive part of it. It is the IDA data, and it's, uh, in, in Danish it's an abbreviation for uh, inter integrated data, uh, uh, labor market database. And it, it has all this data on people's moves uh, and their human capital and so on and so forth, even on, on uh, the, the medical record and, and stuff like that you can get if you want. Uh, so, so 
as some of my colleagues are saying, if people in Denmark knew about all this information that, 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 that we have access to as researchers, they would make a revolution. But, uh, but fortunately, most people don't know about the, the richness of the data. Um, on the other hand, over here, what we did is to, we matched uh, uh, the data here with uh, European Patent Office data through VITA, which is sort of the firm level. Uh, uh, so we, we have uh, firm level identifiers here on, on, from the labor market database, which is based on individuals. We link them to the firm that they work for or have worked for. And then again, we link this up to the uh, EPO data, where we have some matching procedure because we can't identify them 100%, but we have a pretty good match, which is, I believe, is above 90%. Um, so we, we have access to all Danish patent applications 78 to 2004. Um, there is, however, um, a, a data break in the analysis, so we can only work with 2000, uh, for 2000 and, uh, from 2000 to 2004. And we have 2000, 292 firms that have patented uh, in that period. Uh, we have a number of variables in here. We have R&D workers, uh, individuals, Individuals uh, aged uh, uh, 20 to 75, they have a master or PhD degree in technical sciences. Um, and we also have some support workers uh, that, that we just control for that, that have lower technological uh, degrees. We look at mobility, as I said before, stayers, firm joiners, joiners from universities, and other joiners. Uh, and then we control for, for uh, technicians that we call R&D support workers. Uh, I, I will not talk about the econometrics here, but, but I just show this slide to show that we are, we are claiming some kind of causal inference here. So we believe that the causation runs from hiring people, say from universities, into innovation outcomes. And we have some challenges that I'll not go into, uh, and they can also be questioned on some accounts. I'm happy to discuss that. Uh, but we, we, we try to do the best we can on, on, on these accounts. What do we find? Um, well, we find that... Uh, Firm joiners from any other organization contribute more to innovative activity uh, than those who stayed inside the corporation. So it's good to move around. Uh, uh, firms really need to upgrade their hum human capital on a, on a continuous basis. I think that also goes for universities. Uh, maybe I should think of, of that given that I've been at Copenhagen Business School since 98. But uh, <laughs> I think it goes both ways. Uh, maybe it's for that reason I'm visiting in, at Boston University right now. Uh, but this kind of circulation uh, seems to be very important. Uh, among the joiners, uh, hired uh, university researchers, they give the most effect on patent outcomes. So uh, subsequent to having hired uh, uh, people, you get more patent outcome when it's, it's people that come from the university that have also work experience within the university. Uh, but it's only uh, true to some extent. It is only true to the extent that firms have experience in, um, in having hired university researchers before. So it shows that there are these kind of, let's call, we can, somebody here has called them barriers. But it's not easy to hire the first one, uh, at least is our uh, interpretation. So there, there's potentially a lot of benefits here, but probably on the, on the firm side, uh, it is difficult to make, the first, uh, to make the first hire because of all these conflicting norms and, and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, we also find support for the complementarity um, uh, hypothesis. The idea that your graduates, the newly graduates you get into the firm, they seem to become more productive when you have scientists in-house already. Um, so there's a lot of uh, support here for university. Uh, industry collaboration, but it definitely shows that it's not an easy thing to, um, to do. Um, it's difficult to integrate these researchers uh, in private for-profit firms, but on the other hand, they, they do have a great promise. All right, this I will not talk about. Some broad implications here towards the end. Uh, firms can benefit in their innovative activities from hiring scientists but it involves a very difficult uh, learning pro process initially. Uh, drawing on university research in, for, in, in, in firms' innovative activities depends uh, on firms' general attitude towards openness. And I, I have other papers on this, and I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this. In many cases, in fact, 
probably in most cases, open innovation problems are, are not necessarily open innovation problems. They are organizational problems inside those uh, organizations. So it's, it's not only uh, a problem that firms do not rely on univers universities as a source of, uh, of, 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 of innovation, but it, it, it is often related to some more fundamental organizational uh, problems. So th that's another research interest I have. I'll not elaborate on that here. Um, despite this increased usefulness, I think it's important that to recognize that scientists, uh, in, in, in the sense of university scientists, are different creatures than, than uh, uh, people who work in, in, in private research. And that, in other words, that technological research is different from scientific research in most areas. Not in all, but in most areas. So I'd like to end off this talk with uh, citing one of my mentors, Keith Pavitt at the University of Sussex, who uh, once wrote that the application of basic research depends overwhelmingly on the size and the persistence in investment in downstream activities by business firms. So it's, it's, it's really a responsibility of business firms to do this. Dealing with deficiencies in business R&D by making basic research more relevant is like pushing a piece of string, uh, which we know is, is going to be pretty difficult. So on that note, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kel, for your interesting presentation. Now we have some minutes for uh, questions, for comments there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a question about the, the type of people to be hired from university to industry, because um, uh, we cannot uh, uh, address the same kind of approach if we like to, have a, to hire a young researcher even a postdoc, but uh, in order to do some kind of uh, specific research into the firm, and then, to, and then having the possibility to hire uh, even part-time or just uh, during a limited period of time, uh, senior people uh, with a different role into the company. One thing is just uh, to hire these kind of people to manage a new department and then to be able to, to launch a new type of activity than simply to have a people to, to do research into the company. Then what is your experience? Because the, the approaches, the mechanisms, and even the, the mentality to do that is, should be completely different. Right, so, so actually if, if we go into the descriptives of, of our analysis, it turns out that uh, by, by far the majority of the people that are hired into private firms are relatively young, so they don't have a long career inside the university system. So it's typically, this is our interpretation when we look at the data, that it's after, a, let's say, a negative tenure decision uh, at the university, then people go out in private business. So it's, it, uh, you're, you're right in the sense that... Um, there needs to be complementary mechanisms because it's the hiring, uh, from a descriptive point of view, it doesn't uh, strongly involve senior people from the university. They, they, have to be, uh, they have to be engaged in other ways, so to speak. Part-time is, is, is one possibility. But obviously, from a research perspective, um, it's always nice to have some resources. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that is one very important mechanism that private firms give resources to researchers at, at, at universities and then work, work jointly on projects. Uh, but it's, it's, we don't observe very often that very senior scientists make this move. Yes, please. Eric Pisca from the University of Copenhagen. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, you concluded that employing university scientists for private companies is challenging. But what about other ways of cooperation between university and transferring of knowledge from university to uh, private companies? Did you study that as well? Uh, I, I have not, I have not, uh, well, I, I've, I've looked at other sorts of, uh, of drivers, more structural drivers that would, that would uh, w what are the typical characteristics of firms that would then engage with, uh, with the university industry uh, uh, coll collaboration. Uh, but of course, uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right, there are many other mechanisms than the one that we are alluding to. It, it is just if, if you're an empiricist that I am also, then, then I think that these, um, this setting where we look at mobility highlights uh, some other factors that would also be true for other types of collaboration, but where the, uh, let's say the mechanism is let, less clear. I mean, here it's clear we can observe one person moves from here to there. In, in another setting where it's a part-time or where it's a collaborative pr project, it is less easy to identify. But, but I think some of the same challenges, well, I mean, I, I don't, 
think that, I mean, we know that from research, that the same challenges are present with other, let's say, governance forms where, where you have uh, mixed mold uh, 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 organizations and stuff like that, yeah. Yes, please. It's going to be the last question. Uh, Thomas Marken from Münster. How would you know that uh, the innovation uh, rate or number of patents is uh, the depending variable? Why not the other way around, that uh, companies doing a lot of uh, innovation are attracting um, people uh, so that uh, the depending variable is uh, the movement and not the other way around? Right. So this is clearly this is the, the sort of the first alternative explanation that we would like to rule out. And actually, on this one, I'm happy with because I think we do a pretty good job on this particular aspect. There are other problematic aspects because when I when I put it so strong that we want to make causal inference, uh, I have to be taken on the word on this. But actually, we control for. Uh, uh, firm-specific characteristics uh, in the sense that we, we use this pre-sample uh, estimator. So that's kind of like a, a, a fixed effects estimator where we hold each corporation constant. So it's not because a single organization is somehow better than other organizations. This I think we rule out pretty much. I mean to honest, the, 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 the concern could more be that over time perhaps companies get good ideas and when they get this good idea they would hire people at that point in time. That is, we're also trying to rule that out, but here we rely more on indirect evidence. So, so, so it's, uh, but I think the firm specific one, that, that one we, we have taken care of. So, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't run the other way around in that sense. Okay, well thank you very much, Gail, for the presentation. And <laughs> next. <laughs>